Welcome everyone to another CO2 Monday and the Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. I'm your host, Trevor Matthews, and today I have a returning guest, a good friend of mine, James Bailey from Omega Solutions. Uh, this is going to be a really good conversation because it's something I am still learning about. I heard about it a few years ago, net zero, probably five or six years ago, and electrification and all these different terms that I didn't really understand. And James has been involved with Net Zero for many, many years, involved in projects and understanding, doing consulting work. And I thought he would have been a great guest to come on to talk about this. James, welcome to CO2 Mondays and Refriger- Refrigeration Mentor Podcast. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing well, Trevor. Thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me again, six months down the line. Thoroughly enjoy CO2 Mondays. Um, just a big Big shout out to everybody who's taken time of their evening and their afternoon to join us today. Hopefully it'll be, yeah, people find it interesting. It's a little bit different is this one. Um, I've broken up a presentation, which I'll be going through just shortly and and hopefully encourage some uh, participation from the audience uh, once I've gone through the slide deck on six what I see as crucial issues, how they relate to us in cooling and heating, specifically from my experience in the retail sector, as they relate to net zero. So Trevor, are you okay if I make a start with the presentation? Yeah, I'd love it. So thanks for introducing me, Trevor. So I'm James Bailey. I've been in working in engineering from leaving school 26 years ago. I've worked in the refrigeration sector for 20 years. Um, held a range of roles um, from contractor through to consulting engineer. I now with my brand new venture as of 2022, Amiga Solutions. Amiga Solutions provides two levels of service offering, uh, one around education, one around engineering. So typical and traditional refrigeration and low carbon engineering consultancy and one which serves to be a mentoring process for junior apprentice trainee engineers and junior managers. I'm a chartered engineer and also a fellow of the Institute of Refrigeration, two things I'm particularly proud about. You should be. So thank you, Trevor. So topics for this evening. The majority of this presentation is going to be a a holistic overview of what net zero is. And then the one that really affects us within our industry as we switch away from high global warming potential refrigerants which is fugitive emissions, so refri- so leakage and meeting legislation with some examples included. I'm going to provide a, an example of a quick win and the associated benefits to reduce emissions in retail refrigeration. And then at the end of the presentation, I've labelled just one slide a discussion, which I'm hoping to get some real good participation from everybody and questions such as regarding recovering waste heat, the importance of global warming potential, energy efficiency, what options are out there? Because we've got some really cool options in the net zero zero sphere, especially as we look to electrify our heating requirements. Skill set, big, big challenge, skill skill set across the board through design, through install, through commissioning to service and maintenance technicians. We do have challenges in the industry and possibly the biggest challenge is actually investment, you know, how do we sell the message of net zero um, to get our customers to invest and invest correctly in the future of their estates? So talking about net zero, so as a real footnote, the best way of describing net zero, it, it refers to a state in which the greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere are balanced by removal out of the atmosphere. Really came to life via the Paris Agreement which is an international treaty on climate change, which was adopted in 2015. So it covers it covers climate change mitigation, adaptation and finance. I'm pleased to say here in the UK, we're a key signatory to the net zero aims and aspirations and hope to be a net zero nation by 2050. So the agreement negotiated was by 196 parties or countries at the UN Climate Change Conference in 2015. The overriding goal is to limit global warming to an ideal target of 1.5 degrees Celsius compared to pre-industrial levels. To achieve this long-term temperature goal, countries aim to reach global peaking of greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible to achieve a climate neutral world by mid-century. So I've got a real nice slide here. 
So we start off at the year 2000 and it's covering us for a century up to 2100. What is net zero? Net zero is about avoiding dangerous climate change and it has to be limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius. This means that the global economy, economy must deliver a decarbonisation pathway aligned to 1.5 degrees C and targeting net zero, rebalancing whatever we put in the atmosphere to neutral by 2050 at the latest. And the global rate of decarbonisation, it has to, must, has to rap, rapidly accelerate to achieve net zero by 2050 from a reduction acceleration level of 2.4% a year in 2019, up to 11.7% per year. For every year of delayed action, this makes the rate significantly increases, making net zero more challenging to achieve and enhance the risk of more disruptive and abrupt policy response by governments. So we can clearly see here on a business as usual rate for 20 for 19 years, we saw a 1.5% average reduction. From 2019, we're seeing a, an intensity in reduction by 2.4%. But where we see when we get to the right hand side to actually achieve that 1.5 degrees Celsius reduction, we need to really hit this and hit it, hit it hard to achieve what we need to achieve in, the, in getting to net zero emissions. So, James, I'm sure you're going to get into it, but what has been done for the last, I guess, 19 years, I guess it was 2000 to 2019 to get that 1.5%. Uh, will you get into what has been done for the last 20 years to what's gonna what we need to do for the next 80? Yeah, sure. I think so. I think there's 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 obviously what we what we've done as an industry and sector is relatively small scale in terms of reducing GWP, re reducing refrigerant leakage. For me, I think the biggest two spheres are cars and transport. I think cars have inherently become more efficient. I think people don't have as large a vehicles as they used to have. And I think there's been a larger uptake as well around the world. Um, nowhere near sufficient, but there's been good, there's been good inroads made in renewable sources of energy, Trevor. So solar okay. PV, um, wind turbines, etc. I know just uh, I'll just fire this out there. So back in 2008, the carbon and carbon factor that I used, which is a government published figure on an annual basis, which effectively helps you map out and calculate your carbon emissions um, from energy electricity generation was 0.6. That now is 0.21233. So we can see in the UK in isolation, we've seen a, around a two thirds reduction. So all these little incremental changes have made a big difference but nowhere near as big a difference as what we really need to face into. And hence why, as an industry, we're all pushing, promoting and learning about low global warming potential refrigeration systems and how can we use these systems smarter? How can we design them smarter? How can we service them smarter with the aim and aspiration of reducing energy consumption? And also these these things which I'll touch on during the presentation, fugitive emissions. These emissions that we can actually control the, within our control and grasp as an industry. Moving on, Trevor, this is the, the, um, there are three scopes on measurements of net zeros. The protocol places them into the three scopes. Scope one and scope two are relatively the easier of the two to map out, to understand, to do something about. And then there's stage three, the scope three. In terms of um, scope one, there are four groups. Stationary combustion, the type of energy used in an organization's building. This could typically be gas for heating, or electricity for lighting, if we're in a retail sphere, for refrigeration, for air conditioning, ventilation, etc. Mobile consumption. So an example being emissions generated from company vehicles fugitive emissions, and these are in our control. And I've got experience of some really good schemes that have been put, that have been introduced to reduce fugitive emissions. So these are 
effectively refrigerant leakage, fugitive emissions. So, okay, let's talk about refrigeration air conditioning. We have two levels, direct, those emissions associated with leakage, and indirect, those associated with energy consumption. So for me, it's whilst we must reduce global warming potential of any refrigerant down to the lowest common denominator, at the same time, we must make these systems energy efficient because if we're going to, if we're going to reduce the direct emissions on one hand, but on the other hand, we're not going to introduce systems that are as equally or more efficient, we're kind of robbing Peter to pay for Paul, as they say in the UK. Latterly, process emissions. Emissions released from the manufacturing of products used by an organisation. Scope 2 emissions. These are indirect emissions from energy and organisation purchase. These include the heat and emissions produced by power generating companies who provide a business with gas and electricity. This one's a little bit of um, a contentious one here in the UK. We're seeing some, some horrendous rise in the whole scale costs of both electricity and gas at the moment. But if I wind the clock back, say 12 months, um, when energy costs probably went up commensurate with inflation year on year, and so nothing that we felt too hard, the, we could actually have an option with most energy providers to, to purchase energy that's come from renewable sources, specifically for electricity. I don't know how the guarantee what comes from where, and I think there's probably some uh, some some creative and clever accounting, you know, to to offset to, to offset emissions from the electrical yeah. electricity providers. Anyway, you know, I don't profess to know about that, but I think the the long and short of it is, I think that national infrastructures levels that we can't influence, but it's really governments countries continents really need to put a uh, need to stop burning coal stop you stop burning fossil fuels mm -hmm. to generate electricity you know we've got other things out there we've got solar pv we, we've got we, we've got um wind power we know there's contentious and i know that you know relatively speaking you can be quite limited compared to the ability from fossil fuels but let's challenge the art the possible i think for me that's what net zeros all about we've also got nuclear personally i don't know how i feel about that but anyway moving away from scope two and on to scope three so this is where it gets somewhat difficult from all organizations not necessarily a small organization but the larger organizations who we all have experience with on this call we probably all either directly or indirectly provide services to large food retailers um who employ tens of thousands of people, have thousands of facilities, there's going to be a big onus on how they manage emissions connected to their own supply ch chain. Business travel, generated waste, raw material a company buys, such as reams of paper. Where's it come from? You know, IT equipment. Where's it come from? At end of life. Where's it going to end up? Is it going to be recycled? Is it going to end up in landfill? Mm -hmm. So scope three is a very, very big, very big area. And, and, I, and I honestly believe, I don't think we've, I think we've only started to scratch on the surface of what net zero relating to scope three actually means. I didn't even know that was a, a scope, to be honest with you, but it does make sense because I've seen more and more over the years uh, things being recycled. I even see refrigeration equipment, which is great, starting to be more recycled where, uh, and I've seen it years ago with cases and stuff, case manufacturers they would take in and they would refurbish it and stuff. But I see more and more of that happening um, as time goes on, like taking the rat, the frame of a rack where it usually would just get decommissioned and chucked out into the scrap bin so that they're re reusing frames and things like that, which is so smart. We've, we've got a couple actually, a couple of really good companies here in the UK and they remanufacture display cases, Trevor. So obviously there's, there's levels such as if a, freeze, if a frozen food display case has been in for 10, 15 years, the, the panels have probably degraded the insulation, but they, do, they actually do reuse and refurbish whatever they possibly can, whether it's the um, copper coil, whether it's a um, structural, so 
steelwork that's making up that display case. So they actually ensure that the absolute minimum goes to goes to landfill, which which is awesome. And to your point, Trevor, I think as well, I think it's really important just to mention, I think all our perceptions around recycling have changed over the past decade. I know ours have at home, for example, um, we used to have a huge garbage bin, just one, and everything went in it. 10 years ago, we got a secondary one, but that second one was for recycling. And then the main bin was replaced with a smaller bin. And at the time it was like, oh, this is such a pain, this recycling. But as a family now, and we're not unique, you know, I know my family and my friends, we all do the same and we just, we just do it as a matter of due course. The majority of our waste now goes in the goes in the recycling bin the yeah. general waste it doesn't really get used where 10 15 years ago everything just went in the trash you, you know there was no consideration whether or not something could be recycled or not it's funny where i travel around the, even canada the country or even around the world there's so many different policies and i always ask wherever i'm at what do i do with this because some places i still go to even here in canada they don't recycle <laughs> it goes all in the one bag mm. so yeah let's keep moving keep moving on so i'm not going to be going through these line for line this um this is information the source a company called ccs we'd look at the next uh, this and the subsequent two decades and the only reason i brought it up is just to show everybody how big net zero is we live in the world of refrigeration heating, cooling, ventilation, air conditioning. But the reality is, you know, the, we're talking net zero is covering electricity, hydrocarbon, buildings, road transport, industry, land use, agriculture, moving down, aviation, shipping, waste, which we <laughs> touched on. And then we get to our little sphere, which is F gases, <laughs> you know, <laughs> And then we're talking about removals, infrastructure, and core benefits. Although there's a lot for us to achieve in our world and our sector of refrigeration, heating and cooling, there's gonna be a, there's gonna have to be a joined up approach between from every single industry. Every single industry is gonna have to play their part in achieving net zero. And I guess that's the reason for including these two slides, which, as I say, have come from the sources CCS. Um, and I was really blown away by, you know, just how clear it was. But at the same time, that that reality that dawns that thinks, wow, there is so much to be done if we want to leave the planet in a better place than it was, than it has been until recently. That's crazy, the amount of different things that net zero is involved in. It's uh, that's new to me. It's, it's huge, Trevor, and, you know, I'm going to be touching on just some very small snippet areas during today's session. Um, moving on, this one, this one is a um, surrounding fugitive emissions, and it's an example of in retail here in the UK. So I've already described what the fugitive emissions are. So this is a plan of one of the large retailers in the UK, what their plan is to achieve decap or to achieve decarbonisation in refrigeration, specifically fugitive emissions, based on the current F gas regulations. Put in red there, the big one, there's an update due in early 2023. At the moment, we're working up to a reduction of 79% in tonnes of CO2 equivalent compared to a datum year of 2011 by 2030. I believe it's going to be end up being more aggressive than a 79% reduction. But spending a little bit of time on the chart on the left-hand side, the orange line is actually depicting what the F-gas regulations are. So effectively back in 2011, that's our start point. We're seeing a gradual drop. Then we're seeing regulation hitting and the quarter supplies dropping, then dropping some more. So we're about to come to another to another quite a substantial drop in the coming year, all the way up to 2030, where we can see we're actually at a 79% level. So this has been a big, the big reason 
this is a large part, a big reason for why we're seeing refrigerants like R404A being rightly superseded. You know, it began, it, that began well over a decade ago, really, with the introduction of R407F and R407A. Then we saw um, the introduction of R448A and R449A, and then alternatives. So I call alternatives. Um, so I'm going on what I'd class as an alternative to meet the Kigali Agreement, which is an 85% reduction. So it cuts deeper than the F gas and it's a global. So I'm classifying here alternatives being CO2, being hydrocarbons, being HFOs, lots of debate around HFOs going on at the moment, which this isn't the, really the audience for, but still nevertheless, that's going to be a real interesting discussion point here. But moving to the right hand side of the graph, you can actually see um, this particular retailer starting at 2020. You can see the bulk of their refrigerant was R407F. Only a tiny little bit of uh, R40, only a little bit of R407A. <laughs> they jumped the gun from 407A to 407F when it came out. But you can see this retail have actually done a very, very good job of eliminating our 404A. So if I'd have gone, say, 10, 12 years ago, that grey bar would have would have been the vast majority. So yeah. how they're tackling their F gas, Trevor, at the moment is they're actually, they're still introducing more 448A, so you can see it gradually, but they're only doing that on the quick win, so they're recovering the 404A and the 407 refrigerants over a period of um, a, a programme of works, replacing it with 448A, but when there's a full capital replacement plan in place, they're putting alternative refrigeration systems and refrigerants in. So as we can see from 2020, we're in 2022 now, so year on year, the growth in alternatives is growing. Now, I hear people probably thinking here, well, we can't use HFCs after 2030 um, or HFC refrigerants with a certain GWP, which is going to be around the 300 mark for supply chain issues. What this particular retailer is doing is they're sending the 404A back, you know, that, that's going to get reprocessed, that will, that will be destroyed. But your 407s and your 404 refrigerants that are replaced, they'll be cleaned up and they'll be used for service and maintenance purposes. Because obviously, you're looking at an, a, a supermarket estate in the UK who maybe has 500 stores. The likely cost to replace equipment, plants, display cases is probably one and a quarter million pounds. You know, to do 500 stores in an eight year window at a cost of one and a quarter million pounds, that's difficult. That's difficult yeah. for them to achieve. So, so although I, you know, I think we'd all on the call would like to see things being aggressive, I do like the structured plan that this particular retailer is working toward. Well, they have a plan, which is good. And step one yeah. is to have a plan. Absolutely, absolutely. So I think just moving on somewhat, this is, um, this is a piece of work I've done uh, recently. And I just wanted to share with everybody before we get into any discussions around CO2 heat, heat pumps or CO2 refrigeration systems, just a relatively simple concept that you don't have to actually be an engineer to actually understand in terms of how the sector can reduce emissions. In the UK, Trevor, as you know, the majority of chillers, so chilled food display cases and cabinets are open fronted. Historically, the perception has been that they've served to be a barrier of trade. So people will potentially buy less food because they've got to open a door to get the product to put it in their trolley or in their basket. So what I've done here is it's a piece of work. So I've called the big four, the big four supermarkets in the UK, are Tesco, Sainsbury, Asda and Morrison's. So the year energy saving, if they put doors on all their chill display cases, is 151,000 kilowatt hours. This is a per store, 
This is over £41,000 and it reduces emissions by 32.23 tonnes of CO2 per year. The big number here is if all the big four, if all supermarkets, I call supermarkets those of a certain footprint, such as Aldi, Lidl, M&S, Waitrose, similar size, less refrigeration than a big four, and then convenience changed chains, such as the co-op and spa group, the combined annual, annual energy saving is nearly 200 million pounds per year. CO2, the CO2 number is 153,527 tons of CO2. This is a big, this is an easy win. Not all emission reductions connected to next zero are as simple. But what I love about this as well, it, with it being a quick win. So for a lay person, somebody who's not an engineer, what does a door do? Door on shop fridges, keep, it keeps the cold inside. This reduces energy. The payback based upon the cost increase and in unit rate price of electricity in the UK, the payback period is 1.4 years. Wow, yeah. I, I, I don't, I remember even 15 years ago, like, or 12 years ago, me doing retrofits in lots of stores and putting doors on, like that mm -hmm. was part of, and I did many retrofits where I'm going in and do, we're doing a reno and we would be putting doors on like dairy, dairy cases, you know, we'd be mm -hmm. adding the doors or replacing the cases that were dairy or whatever produce and adding doors on there, um, meat as well no like meat shelf so and i guess over the years some did it and some didn't and you're saying in the uk it might have happened a little bit but not very much not very much at all i think the and it's only been the last three four years trevor apart from the few handful of stores uh, the co-op they were really the first to um to make a statement and impact when it came to doors um, Aldi, Aldi are doing a great job in the UK for the past couple of years. The RAM trials, the the saw little impact to trade, the saw energy savings. Um, Asda are now going through a big period of door rollout, as are all other supermarkets now. Mm -hmm. But in the UK, as as backward as it may sound, five years ago, if you're going into a supermarket to see a door on a fridge, it was uncommon. It was really, really uncommon. To an extent, it still is now. And when you're actually in the UK, I'll, I'll be able to show you some stores. I think you'd probably be amazed about the, the, the things that we're doing. We're doing some really good things in the UK. But other things, such as open-fronted chillers, you know, another consequential impact of not having doors is your impact on your HVAC system. The reality is all that cold spillage that falls out of those cases, it makes those aisles cold to offset and to increase comfort for shoppers and the workers in these shops. You're actually blasting more heat into the more heat than what you actually need to, to keep yeah. them more comfortable. And actually, a lot of that heat is going back into the fridges, so it's increasing the heat extraction and it's making those fridges work harder anyway. Yeah, and I remember something you said even earlier about the doors because and I had this conversation with people before and it's all about marketing because people, like you said, people don't want to open that door to grab something and statistics show if there was no doors on it, like coffin cases or doors, they're easier to go grab something, pull out and buy it, even if they don't need it and the, they get a higher turn, turn rate on the product because there's no doors. And I've even seen there's new doors now where they'll have like, uh, I guess not LEDs, but like pictures in the doors to make people want to open, have the sale on there. And all of a sudden they look at it and then they'll open in order to give them a, a thing. But I think at the end of the day, that doesn't matter. I think we need to look at how it can be more efficient, you know, and having doors on their hands down is more efficient. <laughs> hands down. And it's a relatively easy one. I mean, the most difficult thing of doing that in a retrofit application is it comes to your pipe sizes, you know, are you going to get, are you going to get your oil to return because ultimately you're going to have a suction riser that's going to be oversized, but Away from that, everything else is relatively straightforward to manage. I think the biggest one, before I just move off this slide, is the emission saving that I quoted. This is absolutely incredible. 
if every UK supermarket or shop had doors on their chilled cases, it would reduce emissions to the level of over 231 transatlantic return flights. So that's London to New York on a 737. <laughs> that's or, huge. Or boiling a typical kettle for cups of tea and coffee in the UK throughout the UK 90, for over 90 days. It's well, it's kind of a no-brainer, and there's a payback as well. That's huge. Yeah. And I like seeing these statistics. Then you can make sense of it. You can think about it. Well, what does that really mean? You know? Uh, well, it means 231 less flights. That brings me to the end of the presentation, everybody. So I'll, I'm going to close the uh, slide down. Hopefully just a loose, fluid discussion um, regarding specifically net zero as it relates to us. And I, I see there being six core components. The recovery of waste heat. GWP, energy efficiency, options, skills, and investment. So hopefully everybody's um, enjoyed the presentation. And yeah. So really my understanding, and I'm, not, I'm just learning about net zero, it's, it's the amount of energy uh, that you use um, or that you create that you don't use. So if you need to use a megawatt, but you produce a megawatt through solar power, through turbines, through whatever means that it's, you don't have to use power from the grid. Is that basically what net zero is for a building? Well, what we're saying for a building, Trevor, is you're absolutely right. We'll use that, we'll use that megawatt. If you need to use a megawatt, you need to use a megawatt. Now, the reality is, if we use a megawatt and the electricity that's delivered to that building has been delivered through burning coal or fossil fuel, the emissions, it's the emissions in terms of generating that electricity. So a megawatt's still a megawatt, but if you're getting that megawatt produced through renewable sources such as solar, such as wind turbines, that's where we come where net zero comes into effect so effectively we're looking to whatever we put in we take take back out so for example yeah you know, i've recently been to uh, las vegas on vacation went out into the desert and i saw this huge solar farm and i forget the statistic now um i was on a on like a on a top on a tour going into the desert and the driver actually said that this farm here actually produces enough electricity for x tens of thousands of residents in the nevada area which was you know really really cool to know and ultimately there was a hell of a lot of uh, you know we, we but what we are seeing is um we're seeing some challenges back when we talk about solar when we talk about wind turbine because they're not aesthetically pleasing you know, what the eye can't see doesn't, it's, a, it's perceptionary. So we don't necessarily see the burning of uh, coal or fossil fuels. So it's a real, it's a real yeah. difficult, and it's a mind step change that people need. Yeah, because in the, my understanding, like if so, if you have a, say a supermarket or a store and you want to go net zero, there's so many factors in there. Mm -hmm. So probably building orientation, like where's the sun hitting mm -hmm. the, the thing? You'll need LEDs, shades for window, I'm sure. I'm sure there's lots of different things. But Maybe. I think for our side, our... go ahead, James. Well, there's so much, Trevor. So keeping on that theme, because I've just done quite a big piece of work, <laughs> using rainwater is another one, rainwater harvesting. You know, to use for grey water, such as flushing toilets and things like that. Water, instead of using virgin produced water, let's use, let's collect it at source and use it at source. So there's all these things. And one of the big things for me is business of travel. So if we, if we talk about retail refrigeration and a, a, a big supermarket might have thousands of customers per day, they're all driving. Like we all drive to that to that supermarket and we drive home. Well, 
I guess that probably 95% of people on this call know I, he, I, I'm as bad as any the next person. I've got a diesel car. But imagine the emissions that are generated from, say, a 10 or a 15 mile round trip to go to the shop. And you multiply that out by 1,000 customers or 2,000 customers every day, then over 365 days. Imagine the emission intensity. Imagine. So the bigger sphere of net zero is if we all had electric vehicles, and actually I think we're way off getting some real meaningful um, mileage availability from the batteries at this moment in time. But that, was, that also is contributing to net zero. That is a scope three emission for supermarkets that they need to consider their own. I get yeah. But then we've got, the, we've, we've got the other side of this, Trevor, with net zero is infrastructure, critical infrastructure. I know here in the UK, what we call our national grid, it's already overburdened and oversubscribed everywhere. So if we flicked off the switch overnight and petrol and diesel vehicles were no more, the amount of power and the, the, the ability for the national grid to support millions of people plugging a charge point into their car all at the same time would have a drastic impact. So it's so wide. Yeah. But I yeah, think it would be. Not, talking what we do, Trevor, refrigeration and cooling, heating and cooling, I think the big one for me is it's, it's got to be global warming potentially. It's got to be fugitive emissions. So mm. we've got to look at let's reduce the amount of leakage from a refrigeration system, whether it be a HFC or a CO2 system. You know, let's try our best to get those leaks down to a minimal. When, when we do get them, give the technicians sufficient time to rectify those leaks and make sure those systems are leak tight. Let's make these systems efficient. I mean, yeah. crikey, we, we look at CO2 and the high pressure, that high pressure on the discharge side, as you well know, Trevor, you've got more experience than me, the amount of heat that is available is incredible. You know, we need to be looking and using that heat. CO2 heat pumps, Hey, that's where CO2 can really come into its own. We can get some real high coefficient of performance from CO2 heat pump compressors. You know, and I've seen them successfully deployed here in the UK. I've also seen them unsuccessfully deployed where systems have been a little bit too complex for your average journeyman technician. You know, I think mm. there's there's got to be a compromise to ensure that... <laughs> It's not technicians having the ability to understand. I think it comes down to consistency and repeatability between OEMs and making sure that a rack is very similar from one manufacturer to the next. Yeah, they'll all have their own little quirks and ideas and innovations, but on the whole, to present something which a service tech can understand and can set up and can maintain at a really efficient level. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, and it, it will come. I can see more and more. I talk to more and more technicians and business owners getting involved with CO2 and working their way in there. Um, but net zero, I think, is going to, for me personally, what I see is that uh, CO2 is w a really good option for net zero uh, supermarket for sure and building because it's really the five things that you need. You need freezing, you need cooling. Um, you need space cooling, you need space heating, and you need hot water, you know, when you need warm water. And with CO2, you can do all that stuff, you know, at a, at a good rate. And when it's done and designed properly, and it's not too complicated, because CO2 is, it's not complicated, uh, but it's complicated. <laughs> um, but you just need to be trained and learn. But I think from what I'm seeing, I, I've seen a video, I think it came out in 2013, 2014, Walgreens in the US, I can't remember the place, Evanston maybe, they built a net zero building and they had a CO2 transcritical system, they had a CO2, uh, I believe it's geothermal heat pump, ground loop source heat pump. And like you said, the heat, that heat recovery that you can use from there just really changes the game when you're using co2 compared to 
any other of the synthetic refrigerants because you just you can get that hot water you can get that that heat even though you i know i worked on many systems uh, hfc systems where you know they did preheated water but it's not the quality you would get from a co2 system i think you've, just something you touched on there trevor ground source heat pumps the really expensive solution but what a brilliant solution at the same time and there is a return that return is not going to be like putting doors on fridges it's going to be probably eight ten years before a customer sees a payback but you're going to get effective high grade heat and not only that because you, we're using we're using the earth and down below as a, as a sink and a store a lot of a lot of the time where we can use that heat from refrigeration systems in the middle of summer where we might not actually need all we, well we don't need the heat that all the heat that's being generated send it into the ground and use it when you do need to use it and then you know that balance reduce your condensing or the gas gas cooler pressure use it as a heat sink use it as a source get some high grade high cop heating for that store it's um and i think we're going to see i think that's going to be a big big um growth area in and around our industry ground source heat pumps definitely yeah i think so too i know it is uh upfront cost but i i see uh, even there's lots of guests that i had on here and they talked about they're using um using the co2 system to heat the the driveways you know for the trucks to come in you know there's heat in the sidewalks uh heating underneath the freezers and so it all can be done if it's designed properly and this will go right into like when you're trying to go to the that net zero uh, building it, for sure the upfront cost is crazy when you're doing this but it, i think it all depends on where you're at in the world as well because like in western canada where i used to live man there was fields and fields and fields of wind turbines i'm talking fields of them and there was a lot of gener uh, power generation that way and so i think more and more of the when we understand it, I think we're still in the infancy stages, understanding wind, water, um, you know, all these different ways we're getting natural, uh, you know, I guess not, I don't know, renewable energies. I think we're just at the, the cusp of it because I'm sure there's a lot more gonna, gonna be designed or developed. Yeah. What that is, I don't know yet. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Trevor, I'm just gonna say, there's a, there's a question come up into the chat. Um, from uh, oh, it's a comment from Adita. Hi, Adita. Uh, nice to hear from you. Um, so it's just making comment that she saw some of the doors at a co-op in Hereford, um, and really amazed at how much energy can be saved using these, which is absolutely right. And and I actually think that Adita could possibly be making reference to a co-op store, which is the 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 store that. Um, use the first uh, transcritical scroll compressors, Trevor. Oh, wow. I, th I think it's possibly that store, which I still need to go visit. I'm really keen. Yeah. I'm still trying to get one of those and see one of those. I'm hoping at Chilventa, I definitely will see one there. I'm sure Coppola will have one there. So that's my opportunity to see the first one live. Um, but I've been seeing them around the, around the world, different people saying they're in their system. So I'm loving here and, and seeing that because that's another technology that I think is, is going to, blow rate right up because it's something that is it's different but it from what i understand it works so yeah. getting those low uh low temperature systems kind of similar to i had um giacomo uh pisano man what a great episode if you have not checked out the um, the Durain, uh podcast you got to check that one out but he talked about they have uh he has a two they have a two-stage uh co2 transcritical compressor and I didn't know that I think they're the only one where you can do a low temp co2 system with one compressor oh, that's there's more and more coming to the market and that's what it needs that we need innovation like that and yeah, so like, super cool. I think, that stuff is awesome I love learning about that stuff I think the Emerson scroll Trevor just as a just as just growing it out there I think that it's going to be a bit of a game changer because in what I see and what I see with the scroll compressor market is that technicians can handle them on their own. You don't need lifting equipment. You know, so some semi-hermetics, you know, difficult to handle. Whereas a scroll, 
you know, the, the manageable, you've got, you know, four points, it's simple suction discharge connection, electrical connections, oil management system, and it can be replaced quite rapidly. Sure, I'm sure that a question I've asked, which I, I don't know the answer to yet, is what does what is the weight of a transcritical scroll compressor compared to um, a synthetic refrigerant scroll, refrigeration scroll compressor? It's got to be heavier, Trevor, because the, the gauge, the steelwork gauge has got to be higher. Mm. And David, thank you for pointing that out. Doreen, not Doreen, if I said that. <laughs> Jock <laughs> was going to kick my butt. But <laughs> thank you, David. I appreciate that. Um, what else on, on net zero using maybe CO2 or hydrocarbon? Have you seen any of these buildings or any equipment that is going into a, either a net zero building or works towards reducing that carbon footprint? Oh sure, absolutely. Um, one of the what's what's becoming quite popular here in the UK, Trevor, is um, obviously through plate heat exchanger, water side heat exchanger, taking what heat is available as a first stage for heating purposes, and that can be done through um, through an air handling coil or underfloor heating. But what we're actually seeing now in the UK, which for a while, I considered it a little bit counterintuitive, was introducing a false load. So effectively, some retailers are now within their plant area installing quite large evaporators. You're thinking, well, you're putting load in, but that load's being put in there. It's for the cooler times of year when the refrigeration system's not particularly working very hard, reverse cycling one of the machines and actually taking advantage. So you've got the false load outside which it, its sole purpose in its consuming energy but it's actually putting for a little bit you're getting a lot of energy output from the compressor to heat the store so we're seeing that we're seeing that as being quite commonplace in the uk so um i've certainly seen not in uh, large scale sort of the big superstar supermarkets but in average size supermarkets and convenience i'm certainly seeing that uh, grow and the, the traction around that grow and uh, you know it's, it's actually a due, reducing um, sort of HFC based heat pump technologies within their stores because they're actually be, they're able to do everything off one piece of plant and that one piece of plant having a very low GWP yeah yeah it makes sense and we'll, we'll, well like I said we'll continue to see more of this and I really I really believe um since CO2 is starting to get more popular, especially in the supermarket space, and I said it many, many times on the podcast, the technicians are taking their time a little bit more. They're being a bit more diligent where they're going to let a pressure test last, stay longer. You know, that, that one, two days pressure test, even though they know that they need to get the stuff up and running and it's always time, 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 they're always behind the eight ball. But I see and I talk to them, they're like, we just do it. We just wait, and if we're behind, we're behind. We gotta, we want to make sure there are no leaks. Where I've seen, for many years, where it's just like, okay, it's an hour, you're good. Let's Absolutely. just, and then afterwards, go around trying to to find those leaks. And I think that's a, that's a big thing that uh, that I see, especially here in Canada. The, the ones that I talk to here in Canada that they're very diligent on, right, trying to get the leaks. And then I had uh, uh, Damon. Uh, Reed from Pro Refrigeration, he said the same thing, he did the first trans critical uh, chiller in North America. And he said the same thing, like they, they're very diligent on trying to make sure that system is tight. And that's important. You gotta, you gotta do that. And uh, so we wouldn't need all this stuff if there was never any leaks. We could have been still way back in the day with our 12s. Our 12s still, Trevor, if the things didn't yeah. leak. But they yeah. do, but you, you raise a real good point. One, um, so I'll mention them by name, Asda in the UK. They, about 15 years ago, very much focused efforts on reducing leakage. And to your point, the where they saw the benefits of what they were doing through correct, what I call correct leak tests, you know, those that are prolonged for 24 hours, those where technicians have sufficient time to commission a system, they're actually capturing what we know in the UK call the bleeding little bleeders. Those leaks that are now a pressure test, they just ain't going to find. But over time, the, the, the magnitude of those leaks can be quite significant. 
and they took their leak rate from around 20 percent but they're right low real low double digits now so you know if we're doing it for h it's irrelevant really whether or not it's a hfc system hfo or a co2 system i think it's just good solid practice you know just capture those leaks yeah no, i totally agree and, and really uh, you see the difference in the the technicians who who wait and do it right you know yes uh, the upfront time you know is is a lot sometimes the customer's upset and the boss is upset but i see i talk with those technicians who stand their ground those the foreman and the the um, you know the lead foreman and the lead guy say no we gotta wait we gotta wait and then they do that um okay ultra david says ultrasonic leak detector best for small leaks yes so there are devices to find find leaks and that that's one good way to do it does it take time to find yes is it hard yes very hard but be diligent and and, and get it done and find those go around and figure it out any last words james I just just shout just to get a message out there I hope people have enjoyed it i know it's probably been quite a different subject than your average co2 monday so hopefully people have uh enjoyed and still continue to join after tonight's session trevor uh, <laughs> so, i love it how yeah, can just, people get a, how can people get a hold of you james if they want to learn more about omega oh, solutions absolutely. more about your what you do and um oh, message to david yes i am i am david i am from yorkshire um so as strong as it probably gets as well accent wise i live on the border of western north yorkshire middlesbrough David's about an hour up the road from me. Awesome. Well, there's a connection. This is what CO2 Monday is all Absolutely. about. Connecting people. So, yeah. Awesome. So in terms of finding me, um, easiest place, my email address, info at Amiga, O-M-E-G-A hyphen solutions.co.uk. But I think the simpler way is just hook up LinkedIn with me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Awesome. So James, I want to thank you so much. I learned a bunch about net zero and especially some of those slides that you showed. Very interesting. I think I'm going to dive in a bit more because I, I see this, I see this going to be a continued growing trend over the next 10, 20 years. So I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to, to hang out with us today. Please share this on any of your social media um, platforms and we'll see you at the next CO2 Monday. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hey, I want to thank you for taking the time to watch this video. I hope you got something out of it, something that you can use in your daily life. If you like this video, hit the thumbs up button, hit the subscribe button, and click the bell button because when you do click the bell button, it will notify you anytime new videos are released. Also, check out the Refrigeration Mentor webpage at refrigerationmentor.com where I'll have all the different trainings, upcoming events, the different podcasts I've been on, as well as the Refrigeration Mentor podcast. If you want to check that out on Apple, Spotify, Google, any service provider of your choice. Super excited to see you at the next video. Now let's get a conversation going.